días a todos y a todas las participantes del Seminario Internacional. Mi nombre es Gilberto Cisterna, coordinador Universidad Escuela del Proyecto FIT y seré el moderador de estos dos talleres de esta jornada. Bien, entonces, continuamos y damos paso al taller. No debemos pedir a otros que cambien sus prácticas hasta que hayamos cambiado las nuestras, a cargo de Tom Russell. Contarles que Tom es doctor en filosofía de la Universidad de Toronto y es académico de la Universidad de Queens, en Canadá. Sus áreas de interés se centran en la enseñanza de las ciencias y la formación de profesores. Dejo con ustedes a Tom. Bienvenido, Tom. Thank you very much, Roberto. Muy buenos días a todos. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be able to speak with you again today. Um, I have two goals in... Sorry, just a minute. Let's, yes. Uh, I have two goals in uh, this uh, event, which is being called a workshop. I apologize if it appears to be more like a uh, presentation or a lecture than a, uh, a workshop. But I, uh, I think it's important first, uh, in response to some questions from yesterday, I would like to begin by describing the teaching procedure, uh, predict, observe, explain, or PAOA, uh, that I mentioned yesterday. Uh, then, uh, after briefly explaining that, I would like to describe the self-study of my own practice that inspired the title uh, for this workshop. Uh, this is a, an example of a predict, observe, explain event that a science teacher might decide to use. Uh, in uh, the three diagrams, uh, there are weights hanging on the ends, on, the, on both ends of a piece of string that is hung over a pulley. Uh, we start with the one on the left, uh, where the two equal weights, one is on the ground and the other is hanging in the air. In the second one, both are at the same height. And in the last one, the uh, one on the left is higher up and the one on the right has dropped to the ground. If we start with the one on the left uh, in figure A, uh, the students are asked to predict uh, what will happen when the, uh, when the teacher lets go of the weight that he is holding down to the ground on the left-hand side. And so the question is, will the, will the two weights adjust until they're at equal heights? or will the one on the right pull the one on the left up higher into the air? Uh, the students are then asked to write, to choose one and to write an explanation. Um, then they are, before they are asked to observe what happens in this experiment, they are asked to share, in my classes, I ask them to share the prediction, but I want them to share it in a way where nobody else sees what they predict. Que nadie pueda ver que predicen. Unusual to ask all the students in your class to close their eyes, uh, but if you do it, uh, they will respond and they will quickly get used to the habit. Um, and then you uh, <clears throat> write, write the three possibilities on the blackboard and ask them to raise their hand when, they, when the one that they uh, want to predict is called for. And At that point, uh, I write the numbers on the board uh, so that when we're finished, I ask them to open their eyes and they can all see that there have been predictions for each of the three answers. Um, then we actually do the experiment and uh, record what happened and develop as a group an explanation uh, that fits with uh, the science a la idea científica que estamos tratando de explicar. Me parece importante mencionar que este procedimiento está 
in, a, in an English class where the class is reading a book, uh, the students could be asked to predict what's going to be happen, happen in the next chapters and then compare that prediction to uh, what actually happens. In a history class, it's possible to describe the events leading up to a particular event in history and ask the students to predict what might happen and compare it. Uh, last night, I had to ask myself if the procedure can be used in initial teacher education, and I believe it could be, although I regret that I have never tried it myself. Uh, we put a great deal of focus on in teacher education on a lesson plan and having students develop lesson plans. A lesson plan is actually prediction for a class and the teacher student can predict how the students will respond to the plan. The class itself becomes the observation and often for a beginning teacher, there are many surprises in every class. After the class, the student teacher can be asked to try to explain the differences between what he or she predicted and what actually transpired in the class. So I hope those examples help to uh, give you an idea of uh, what PayOA actually represents and how it might work and also how it might be applied in the initial education of teachers. At this point, I want to share with you the story of the most dramatic change in teacher education that I experienced in my 42 years at Queen's University. Um, this uh, dramatic change occurred in the years 1996 to 99. And they were driven, inspired by three years of an unusual cooperation with another university. Um, as I continue into this story, I need to remind you that uh, the teacher education program about which I'm speaking is a little different. It's quite different from the one that you have usually have. Um, most of yours are four or five years leading to a uh, qualification for teaching. In our case, all the students have completed a four-year university degree. So they are roughly typically about 22 years old. Um, and the teacher education program at the time was only about eight months. Uh, in Ontario, that program has now changed to 16 months. Um, in, in the cooperation with another university, we had uh, 25 students coming to join our program after only two years of science studies at that university. This was a university that offers what we call uh, cooperative work terms where the students actually work in uh, professional contexts and receive a small amount of pay for that work. And all 25 of the teachers who came each year had just finished 16 weeks of teaching in a school. Uh, again, going back to the fact that you, it is possible to teach in a school without having had formal preparation for teaching. Um, these students were completely different than any student I'd ever taught before because they had that 16 weeks of experience. Whereas we often struggle to get student teachers to write, these students couldn't be stopped from writing because they wanted to write about and share the experiences they'd had in schools and the questions that they had come to develop from those experiences. Uh, this project that happened provided me with deep sight insights into the traditional nature of initial teacher education and the difficulties of changing those traditions. I'm sure that traditions in Chile are just as strong as the traditions here in Canada. So you might wonder what this experience was that was so dramatic. After we, we tried this with 60 students uh, who volunteered to participate in, the, in 1996. And in 1997 and 1998, we used this procedure for every student in our program. Uh, in Canada, <clears throat> we are fortunate that the university year and the school year 
both begin at the same time at the in early September. And we had the students come to the university one week early to meet their professors, uh, to pay their fees, and to have a brief introduction to lesson planning and to classroom management. And then we sent them to their schools, typically in groups of at least seven or eight, sometimes 10 or 12 in a secondary school. In a uh, primary school, it might have been groups of five, six or seven. Um, the really interesting thing that happened was that on the first day of school, uh, the, there are only two kinds of people in a school. You're either a student. If you're not a student, you must be a teacher. And so even though these people had no formal training as teachers, the students saw them as teachers. Um, I was a practicum supervisor, a, a, a faculty supervisor to the two students in two different schools. And um, this made for a, a really, really unusual and exciting uh, opportunity to study what happens when we really change teacher education in a dramatic way. The, the students arrived in the school on the first day, typically attending a staff meeting at 7.30 in the morning before the students arrived. And they stayed in the school for 16 weeks until the Christmas holiday. The only exception was that near the midpoint of the 16 weeks, they returned to the university for two weeks. The two weeks that I taught uh, my science students uh, were the most intense teaching I've ever done in my life because the students had eight weeks of experience and they were going to return to the same students to continue teaching them for another six weeks. And everything we focused on was questions and problems of practice and how they could address them, what they were learning and how they were going to make changes in their teaching when they returned to the school. Um, sorry, I'll, be, I'll get to that slide in just a minute. The, when the students finished at Christmas, they returned uh, to the university for 16 weeks and, of, and most of this time was classes, although there was another return to schools for four weeks. When I started teaching them uh, in the second half of the year, these students came up with more than 60 topics that they wanted to study in my class. I've never in my life had a class with so many questions and so many relevant issues that they wanted to explore. I had the most exciting teaching again uh, for those uh, 12 weeks that I taught them and at the end of it, they insisted that I receive one of the teaching awards that was being given out. Um, and, I, and I did receive that award thanks to the comments that they made. I was so engrossed in my teaching of these students that I failed to realize that many of my colleagues were very unhappy with the students that they were teaching at the same time I was teaching these science students. And Ultimately, at the end of the program that year, the faculty had a large group meeting and decided that they could no longer continue to teach in that way. It was a, a huge disappointment for me. We did continue for one more year because we had already admitted students to the, uh, the same program. And, uh, and that again was another learning opportunity. But the, the, central, the central message was that even though we had, the schools were in favor of the program, the students were in favor of the program, and uh, the Ministry of Education was in favor of the program, my colleagues were unable to move forward uh, because it was too difficult. Uh, my own personal analysis was that if, and I find this uh, still incredible to say to anybody, Many of the, my colleagues said that they found it too difficult to teach students who had so much teaching experience. 
and yet teaching experience is what we know students have to have before they're going to become the competent people we want in the classroom. Uh, so here I will, uh, I am taking ideas from a uh, paper that I wrote uh, to report my analysis of this experience. And there were two significant effects of the changes that we failed to predict. Every major educational change brings unexpected, unpredictable insights, uh, just like a POA procedure. Some were positive and some were negative. And two of the effects proved particularly significant. The role of the faculty supervisor was more complex and critical to the success of the project than we realized. Where the faculty supervisor was able to interact frequently and successfully with both candidates and teachers in a school, then the new structure seemed successful as well. Where the supervisor was unable to respond to events in the spirit of the new program, it was more difficult for teachers and teacher students to take advantage of the new opportunities for professional learning. The supervisor role proved to be far more intricate and demanding than a simple sum of the traditional one-off visits to candidate to teacher students that we had had previously. In, uh, the, in this case then, rather than visiting the students once during the practicum, the uh, faculty supervisor was a frequent visitor to the school, uh, almost became like another staff member at the school. And while I relished in this opportunity, uh, many of my colleagues found this new role very difficult and we had failed to prepare them adequately for it. Sorry, I'm having trouble changing my screen. There we are. Uh, the second prediction we failed to make was that placing candidates in the school on opening day was more significant than we thought it would be for the people learning to teach. By being in school before the students arrived, the teacher students experienced the, what I call order within chaos of the first day of school and actually got to feel the nervousness that experienced teachers have when they're preparing to meet new classes. The students in every school saw the teacher students as additional teachers who belonged in the school, not as people who came late and would only stay for a few weeks. In addition, experience of the, experiencing the first day of school firsthand seems to, be, to provide the best possible preparation for a personal first day as a newly qualified teacher in the next year. Interestingly, uh, when I was trying to make sense of all these complex issues around such a dramatic change in a teacher education program, I returned to Donald Schoen's uh, second book, Educating the Reflective Practitioner, where I discovered that he had made predictions about what a reflective practicum would actually look like. And I want to take you through uh, some of those predictions and let you see how they fit the situation and help me to understand that we had, we had really made a far more dramatic change than we realized, even though it was clearly a very major change. Uh, I found that it was comfortable to discover that the challenge we faced at Queens University were predictable. Donald Schoen made the following predictions about difficulties of a reflective practicum, like the one that was the centerpiece of our new teacher education course at Queens. Donald Schoen wrote, the introduction of a reflective practicum into a professional school is an uphill or difficult business. The introduction of reflective teaching into a primary or secondary school is an uphill business also. 
If you think about introducing a reflective practice into a school of education, you must work against the view that practice is a second class activity because in the school of education, I think it is. Uh, this comes back then to clearly to one of the issues that I've advanced uh, in my participation in, this sem in these seminars these last two days. We need to do something as teacher educators so that we can give balanced attention both to theory and research and to the significance of practice and the complexities of learning practice. Donald Schoen also wrote that you must work against the view that theory is a privileged form of knowledge. Uh, here I'll step aside for a moment and advance the idea that universities seem to criticize, seem to criticize schools because the schools find it difficult to use the theory that universities find so important. Schools tend to here tend to criticize universities because they are unable to give due attention and provide realistic responses to the problems of practice that are experienced in the school. So not only do we have the, the tension uh, between uh, that the schools tend to criticize the university, but also the university, as we know, tends to criticize the school. And my, as you heard yesterday, my main suggestion for addressing this tension is uh, for each group to find ways to do more careful listening to each other. Donald Schoen also went on to write, you must work against the doctrine that teachers are to be taught the results of research carried out by researchers. The point I was just trying to make. And Schoen wrote that he thinks this helps to account for the widespread sense of irrelevance of courses in schools of education. If we want to have a reflective practicum, we also need to work against the notion that the teacher is a blank slate who needs to be trained and has nothing to bring to the situation uh, arriving as a blank slate. As I tried to suggest yesterday, students already know a great deal about what teachers do, even if they're lacking knowledge of how teachers think about what they do. And as we've seen in many situations, uh, including my own experience 55 years ago, uh, someone who has no formal teacher training can, be, can step into a classroom and over a few months uh, become fairly effective as a teacher. I'll continue with one more of Donald Schoen's uh, comments about a reflective practice, about a reflective practicum. You work against what I'm describing as the squeeze play that currently operates in the profession, as in many professions, where on the one hand, the actual institutional conditions of practice restrict what it is that a practitioner can do. At the same time, if there is a resurgence of technical rationality in the university, which there is, the combination of those two things squeeze what I am calling for in a reflective practicum. So the final messages, <clears throat> sorry, I went too quickly. My final messages for you uh, in this uh, presentation that uh, calls itself a workshop, uh, the, the profound realization was that while I, had, while I and some of my colleagues had responded um, in a rejoicing way to the opportunity to teach students who had a great deal of experience, many of my colleagues were unable to make that leap and failed to learn from the experience. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have many ideas and theories for improving initial teacher education, but they need practices to accompany them. 
And it's not enough for just one person or a few people in a faculty of education or a school of education to develop new practices. It needs to be a collective and group effort. And here we run up against the challenges of sharing practices that were referred to in the presentation by Carolina and Rodrigo. Now that I'm retired, I continue to predict that little progress will be made until the classrooms of initial teacher education at the university become metacognitive, spaces where the focus is on the practices of the teacher educator, as well as on the learning of the teacher students. It all starts with good listening. I see that I've finished with a great deal of time remaining, and so perhaps there can be an opportunity for some questions and answers and discussion. And at this point, I'll stop sharing my screen, and I thank you for your attention. Bien, Tom, interesante presentación. ¿Sí? Vamos a ver si hay alguna pregunta de la audiencia los espectadores que quieran enviar por el chat. Pueden escribir sus preguntas. Una pregunta, no, hasta el momento no tenemos. Maybe we can give people a little time. Puedo preguntar, ¿cómo se avanza hacia una universidad metacognitiva desde la gestión? From a management point of view is an intriguing question. Um, the most, the, the quickest answer would be that the management has to become metacognitive as well. Um, it's typical, at least at my university, uh, for the Dean of Education to make announcements about what's going to happen uh, without particularly explaining uh, why they are doing it and what the thinking is behind the change. Um, and so we also run into the difficulty. Uh, this was another lesson I learned from Donald Schoen. Um, faculty members at university tend not to be honest with management. Uh, they tend to uh, filter what they say to management based on what management wants to hear, what they think management wants to hear, just as students in a class are commonly telling the teacher what they think the teacher wants to hear. Um, if you heard the case of Bruce yesterday, um, many teachers would not want to hear the kind of comment that that student made. Um, and so uh, I really appreciate the question because the... Uh, <laughs> If we're going to become metacognitive in our university classrooms, we need to become metacognitive throughout the uh, throughout the faculty, uh, and it, that would involve management as well. Perfecto. Y el proceso hacia una universidad metacognitiva tiene que ser gradual, convenciendo a los académicos o abrupto, como reingeniería. Uh, if I if I think back to the experience that I just described, I would have to say it would need to be it would need to be step by step. We we did have a step by step approach, and we still missed very important issues. Um, in the in the situation that I described, the dean 
uh, was a very was the second youngest member of faculty when she became the dean, and did not have a lot of administrative experience, and that made it as brilliant as she was and as encouraging and supportive of the idea as she was. Uh, the experienced faculty members found it too easy to uh, develop attacks on what she was doing uh, because they knew faculty knew the faculty so well. Um, definitely it has to be step by step and it has to be careful. Perfecto. Tom, te una pregunta desde su opinión. ¿Por qué habrá tanta resistencia al cambio en las universidades y colegios? ¿Por qué son organizaciones tan resistentes al cambio? The minute I hear that question, I have to think of, uh, I only have two favorite authors in all the educational literature. Uh, you might guess that one of them is, is Donald Schoen and his book, The Reflective Practitioner. The other is a man named Seymour Saracen, who in 1971 published a book called The Culture of the School and the Problem of Change. Uh, it, was, it was the most demanding and powerful book uh, that I read. I managed to read it as soon after it was published. Um, in the book, he argues that the, the way the university operates and the way schools operate are essentially the same. They both, same, they both face the very same challenges of trying to make change. Um, I actually think that one of the reasons why teacher education and teaching in schools uh, stay so stable and uh, change so little is that every one of us who comes into them has already spent 15 or more years learning what school is like. And we have a we develop a very strong and closed view of the way things should be done, the way people should interact, the way teachers and students should interact, the way teachers and administrators or management or principals or head teachers should interact. And because in primary school and in secondary school, there's never any time or opportunity, teachers never make time and opportunity to talk about how they think about their teaching. All students develop is habits from observation and they don't develop clear thinking. And despite uh, spending time at university, uh, those observations never come to be analyzed carefully and understood. And so it becomes, we all enter into teacher education or teaching with a very strong sense of what normal should be. And I think that uh, helps to explain why uh, change is so difficult in both teaching and in teacher education. Thank you for a, a, an excellent question. I'd never thought of it quite that way before. Perfecto, Tom. Matías nos pregunta, en el ejercicio de predecir, observar y explicar, ¿la reflexión debe darse por igual manera en, en estas tres o hay que dar énfasis en una más que en otra? Uh, again, uh, I appreciate your attention to the to this uh, predict, observe, explain issue. Um, the most exciting part is the prediction phase at the beginning. Um, the important thing about asking students to make a private prediction and a private explanation is that this becomes a unique way of making it safe to be wrong in a classroom. We all learn very quickly, probably in the first year of primary school, that all the teacher is interested in is right answers. 
And if we have a wrong answer, that's just inconvenient for the teacher. So the initial prediction phase is very exciting because once the observation occurs, the person who's going to learn the most is the person who made the wrong prediction. The explanation phase is sometimes easy to uh, neglect uh, and the teacher might want to just rush forward with the right answer. But it's very important, again, to give the student an opportunity to ask questions that will help them make the transition from making the incorrect prediction to understanding the explanation for what actually happened. I know that's a, a fairly short response, but I really appreciate, uh, again, the opportunity to uh, explain that a little further. Vamos a ver en el chat. Hay otra pregunta, Tom. Dice que eh, Janes pregunta: ¿Cómo se puede promover una formación en la que la práctica sea el, camp el centro de la enseñanza? ¿Cómo promover el cambio en ese sentido? Ah, uh, um... I suppose one place to start uh, is by realizing that we need to treat, as teacher educators, we need to treat our, our own lesson plans as opportunities for prediction, observation, and explanation. Um, so this is where I keep coming back to the idea of metacognition. Uh, we need to be open about how we are thinking about our thinking as a teacher. Uh, we need to remember that, uh, and this is where I come back to the title that I gave you for this uh, so-called workshop. Um, I should not be predicting, I should not be asking teacher students to use particular practices guided by theory in a school unless I have already used those same practices that I'm asking them to make in the classroom with them. Uh, there's a profound difference between listening to, an ex to a teaching strategy or a suggestion and actually experiencing it personally and having the opportunity to talk about it. Um, I realize that this is a, a, a huge change to make. I did not make it all at once. My first year as a teacher educator, I was a complete disaster. Uh, if I could take just a minute. Um, the year before I moved into doing uh, pre-service teacher education, I worked with a group of five history teachers in one school who all agreed to tape record their teaching, write it out word for word, and share it with each other to find patterns in their teaching. And these, these five teachers who really and truly opened up and collaborated and shared their teaching with each other in a way I've never seen before or since came to two conclusions. And I, I, hope, you will, I hope you will laugh a bit when you hear them. The first conclusion was, I had no idea that I talked so much when I teach. And the second conclusion was even more interesting. I had no idea that it would be so difficult to try to change the way that I teach. Um, both of these are real warnings uh, for anybody who wants to try to take seriously what I've been pushing here today about uh, opening up about our teaching practices. And uh, it all begins, uh, as I suggested yesterday, uh, by finding new ways to listen to the students and find out more about their thinking in anticipation of sharing with them some of your own thinking. Uh, I failed to uh, show you the last slide that I prepared for this event. Uh, and in that, I, I offered to uh, share with you the, if, if you are able to work in English, 
uh, share with you both the paper that I based my presentation this morning on and also uh, the paper that I wrote to report the self-study of my teaching in my last year of teaching two years ago. Uh, I would be happy to share that with anybody uh, and I'd be happy to if the uh, organizers could send my email address to the participants uh, so that they could write to me and, uh, and I'll be happy to share those papers. But um, definitely it's, it's a slow and long-term process uh, if we're going to if we're going to change our practices, we have to remember that it involves learning from experience, and we have to be uh, ready to constantly uh, learn from those experiences and realize that that's going to be a big challenge. Perfecto. Eh, Tom, Alex, una pregunta. En el caso de los profesores part time. ¿En qué momento reflexionar su, reflexionan su práctica profesional si no permanecen en la universidad? Es una realidad del sistema universitario. Muchos profesores part-time o profesores hora, ¿en qué momento reflexionan? Uh, um... I wasn't, I think I wasn't prepared for this particular question, but I'll see what I can do with it. Um, it's a very good question because we are seeing more and more at even at my university that we're relying heavily on people who are only involved part time. Um, typically, the people who work only part time at the university and and have their base in schools are real experts at practice. Uh, and they and they are successful in working with new teachers because of that expertise in practice, and because teacher the teacher students really appreciate uh, hearing from people who have that practical experience. Um, here again, we come back to uh, the need for collaboration and discussion about what it is we're trying to do in a teacher education program. And there never seems to be time to do that. Uh, we need to create safe spaces where teacher educators, uh, both full-time and part-time, uh, can come together and share their experiences and identify the importance of share, sharing those experiences with the people there who are learning to teach. That's not a very good answer to your question, but I, I hope it's a small start. Perfecto, Tom. Bien, estamos en el tiempo y quisiera, Tom, si pudieras eh, comentar o indicar algunas palabras finales de la presentación para la audiencia. Um, sure, let me see if I can do this quickly. Uh, what I'll do is is give you um, give you my email address on the screen if you want to jot it down and I can share these papers. Um, I'm incredibly grateful for the uh, for what I have learned uh, not only about teacher education in Chile but also about myself. Uh, as I've developed and made these two presentations uh, in this conference. Um, I would like to just extend again my thanks to Universidad Católica de Maule for the opportunity to be a part of this very interesting and special event. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Tom, por la participación. Bien, estamos todos muy contentos y muy agradecidos. Bien. En honor al tiempo nos vamos a 15 minutos de receso y volvemos con el último taller donde expone el doctor Andrés Pregali de la Pontificia Universidad Católica Argentina. Nos vemos en 15 minutos.